How does it feel to be the only girl ever to have round two on the Doc Farhan podcast? Well, <laughs> we're only just getting started, right? Ah, that's right. That's right. So let's uh, pick up uh, with Islam, right? Islam. So I want to know. Oh, that was the question that I didn't see. Ah, for sure. For You only <laughs> saw the stuff that doesn't even count, which I don't even look at. In Poland, when you were growing up, you had a perception of what Muslims are. And your friends also had a perception of what Muslims are. Take me through certain moments where this came up and you had this image of a Muslim. Yeah, so I think uh, there was a time that we heard a lot about uh, terrorists and uh, terrorist attacks especially in Europe, which was kind of something new at that time. I don't quite remember it that well because I was uh, still pretty young. But uh, I remember there were some like terrorist attacks in, in the UK, in France, in Belgium, uh, I think also in the Netherlands. And uh, it was just something very scary for us. And we just felt like we don't want to have this kind of people in our country because they will just mess it up or they will be a danger to our society, right? So mm. that was uh, pretty much the only encounter that I had with uh, Muslim people. And it wasn't even uh, like a direct encounter. It was just like we heard that this is happening in those other countries in Europe and also outside of Europe. And uh, we didn't want that to happen to us because we were concerned about our safety so we just thought okay these people are evil they are willing to kill so many innocent people and themselves also so yeah that was the only thing that we ever really heard from my perspective about uh, muslim people so growing up you had no muslim friends no you saw ever saw a muslim live that you knew of like this guy is from islam it was rare in Poland, especially in uh, Bydgoszcz. Um, maybe a little bit more in Warsaw when I moved to Warsaw, but still it was very rare. And I remember the first time I went to London, uh, it was like a cultural shock to me because in Poland we don't have so many cultures mixed uh, together. So you pretty much only saw white people at that time in Poland and uh, even more just Polish people, rarely any foreigners, even in Warsaw. So going to Germany, going to the UK, going to Belgium, going to the Netherlands, it was a shock to me to see people from so many different cultures. So I, I, had, no expo I had no exposure to people like that when I was growing up. But it didn't change. Even though you saw Muslims in UK and Germany, you're like, oh, more ter terrorists here. That's all. I kind of had this thought right. at first uh, before I got more exposure. But you saw them. But you, have you, Had you ever spoken to a Muslim that you knew at that time? UK, Germany, even some guy at the metro station who's like giving you a ticket, whatever. Um, it were very rare. It was very rare. Um, yeah, mostly I didn't have encounters like that before I actually left Poland. Okay, so exposure to the other race or religion or ethnicity doesn't necessarily mean that you have acceptance of them or you have knowledge of them. Just seeing them doesn't matter, does yeah, it? Yeah, it was just like... A Maybe somebody would be like a cashier at the store and I knew uh, they are of a different race, a different religion, a diff different ethnicity. So I wouldn't treat them differently, obviously. But I always had a little bit of fear of the unknown. Like I might not get them I might not understand what's going on in their heads. Like I might not understand their upbringing. So there was always a little bit of fear. 
when I didn't really know anybody like that personally. The reason this is very interesting to me is because, as you know, I'm reading a lot about conformity and obedience to authority. So in, the, in this book, The Obedience Book by Stanley Milgram, he's the guy who did the shock experiments that you know from reading Cialdini. In the first part of the book, he talks about the Jews, and he says that the way Nazi Germany inculcated the mindset of, hey, now we can put Jews in gas, gas chambers, is very slowly dehumanizing them, right? Because you may not want to kill an, a human or a human baby or a human old person, but people hunt animals all the time, right? Joe Rogan hunts animals, like Jocko Willink. Today I was, uh, this morning I heard a podcast with him and Andrew Huberman. Jocko does, uh, he's an ex-Marine. He's all the well, time hunting. I so, would say this is also controversial because to many people, hunting is also not okay. Sure. And I know people like that. Sure, sure, sure. I also know many people like that, right? Most of them are either like vegans or people who are a part of PETA, right? People for the, uh, what is it called? Ethical um, uh, testing of animals, PETA, right? And uh, actually at the end of the last book, the Harry Harlow book, uh, Love at Goon Park, at the end they talk about PETA. And the person who started the PETA movement was a spy and he went to different labs as a student or as an intern and he took all those photos and then he exposed those professors and then he made sure those professors lost their jobs couldn't have their lab anymore basically lost all their their work life's work so PETA did that and going back to dehumanizing people right so in Nazi Germany if when Hitler's Third Reich showed that the Jews are not human, right? He, they convinced people that the Jews are not human because they are other types of terrorists, right? Because a terror, someone who's a terrorist causes terror. So if they convinced people that Jews are these, these little bugs, you know, these little viruses that get in people's heads and destroy communities and they're sort of like filth, then it would be very easy to convince them that we need to kill all of them, right? So now if, if the culture of Poland, or at least where you were growing up, cannot stereotype the whole country, yep. but where you were growing up, why, what is it about authority or obedience to a certain norm, which makes us not question what we believe? Why to you, why did you never question that, hey, let me go read about the history of Islam. Let me go read how, what percentage of Muslims are terrorists or that, that follow a certain terrorist group. Why did you just assume that the authority was right? Well, it's hard to speak about this now because I was really young back then. It was like, uh, I don't know, maybe I was 14 years old, something like that. So I had a very different mentality than I have now. And uh, whatever was said in the news or whatever I heard, I believe that because I didn't think there is a reason for me to question it because I thought, okay, they are just reporting what is happening in those other countries. So I see it, I believe it, right? And I did not have any need to go deeper or to search the truth, which would be very different um, from the way I behave right now. Right. Do you think it is the incentive or the responsibility, not incentive, responsibility of the school system in every country to educate their children about all the races and the truth 
of every single religion, every single ethnicity? Do you think that is a responsibility of the education system, the parents, or the individual, no matter what their age, or the government? Hard for me to say because I remember even when I was in like primary school, we had those classes that were trying to teach us tolerance and it was like we we even had uh, some uh, like uh, special events about uh, tolerating uh, people of different races and cultures and uh, getting to know them but i don't think that really worked because we didn't really have a real exposure of that right. kind so I don't know if we can just say like uh, the this is the responsibility of the uh, education system because um, let's also consider the reality. I remember when I was a kid in school, I didn't necessarily go deep into what I was uh, taught. Sometimes it was just like, oh, I got to study for the test and then forget about it because I was just more focused on what was going on in my life. Like I was growing up, I was most, more concerned uh, about making friends and uh, things like that. And uh, I wasn't really going deep into the subjects taught at school. Yeah. This is not just you. Even, uh, so I read this in Behave. There's a chapter, Us Versus Them, right? And I think it's chapter 13. And in the book, Sapolsky says that babies can differentiate between their own race and other races. Babies, like toddlers. Before they can walk or crawl, they're just like in the crib. And the way they do it is they see the amount of time the baby looks at someone and, and looks away. That's sort of how they gauge attention in a baby. So when white people, like if it's a baby's white, a bunch of white people are shown, the, the baby will have a gaze that will be uh, a, a certain number of seconds or milliseconds, and then they will show a black person or a Chinese person or a brown person or whatever. And they babies can differentiate. And I remember reading a book uh, by a Japanese evolutionary psychologist, Konizawa, I believe his name is. And the book's title is Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. And the uh, there was some genetic study they did where they showed that people who are more attractive have more daughters for whatever reason Interesting. most likely because the daughter has the ability to procreate and you know get get have a bunch of babies um and in this book i believe it's dr konizawa he says that um if you let me see let me see exactly what he said i'm just uh having a, a little brain fart here um it was Oh yeah, that's what he said. He's like, racism is innate in a human being. Every human is born racist. We must be racist. Why? Because the selfish gene, right? This is a book by Richard Dawkins. We want our genes to survive versus other people. So, me being a Pakistani brown person, the of course, we are all human, obviously, we're the same species, but the genetic makeup that I have is more similar to someone who is of my ethnicity, just because of the way evolution happened, just, just the way we are, than someone who grew up way over there in some other part of the world. So, racism makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. And then Konizawa also said that we train people to become not racist. Education allows people to become not racist. Do you believe that? I'm not really sure. Um, because to me, education, it kind of feels like you are forcing somebody to be a certain way, at least in that aspect that we are discussing. To me, based on my own experience, it just kind of happened naturally with more exposure exposure to uh, different kind of people and even ex being exposed to like uh, uh, American uh, movies and uh, 
YouTube and stuff like that. Naturally, at some point, I stopped noticing any differences. And uh, I think I can even say that right now, I don't even see people's uh, races or uh, any like differences in skin colors. It doesn't even matter to me. It's... uh, it's kind of crazy because I remember when I had no exposure, of course, I would notice if somebody had a different skin color. But right now, there is like so much diversity around me. My brain doesn't even see it. It's like it's not even a thing. So then what happened? Tell, take me through the gradual process of you learning about Muslims, learning about Islam, um, maybe learning about the culture, right? And the diversity of the faith. Well, um, regarding Muslims in particular, it was mostly because I got to know you. And uh, before I met you, I didn't really have any like uh, radical views because I think uh, by the age of around 20, I already understood that nothing is really like uh, black and white. And uh, there are so many different people and so many different faiths that you can't just generalize and say like, oh, all the Muslims are terrorists. Even though I think the med- the media was at some point uh, just trying to uh, really force this narrative upon us in Poland, at least. But uh, I, I just understood that you cannot just judge things like that. And uh, I tried more or less consciously to not really have any bias um, and just form my opinion about people based on how they interact with me or how I see them personally interact with others. So... I think shortly before I met you, I didn't really have like a radical opinion on uh, Muslim, uh, Muslims. And uh, then I got to know you and uh, I, you told me what uh, faith you were brought up in. And uh, you told me that your family is uh, still into it and uh, you're not so much. And uh, that was maybe a little bit scary because um, it involved like a direct contact with it. So there was a tiny bit of fear in me, I think, when I when I look at this now from this perspective. But then as soon as I got to meet your family and uh, just get to know that personally, all of this went away, all of fear, all of the fear that I possibly had, it all, it was gone. And I realized that this thing, it doesn't even matter because we are all the same people. So that convinced me even stronger that I should not even think about the faith as a factor in ju- judging someone. Got it, got it. So it, right now, I feel like it doesn't even matter to me. Because <laughs> if I was a different person and my family was a different type of, then it's possible that your belief would have stayed or became worse, right? Because it's interesting because like, I, I'm sure that there are women and I, I remember one girl that I met, I don't know exactly where, but I do remember this story where her husband like uh took the baby away from her and, and like uh, uh used her and, and and he she's like oh i hate all muslims because th- that's what he did because he was a muslim guy oh yeah so it's like uh i don't know man it's like in the morning in, in in our early life if we have a certain cultural experience with an ethnicity maybe we're just going to believe that our whole life I don't believe that unless you have like a really direct experience like that and it creates some sort of trauma in you. Because I remember when I was still a kid, like 12, 13 years old, 
I saw in the TV, uh, they there were like some documentary uh, or like some kind of uh, reality show type programs, and they would even invite um, the. Um, how do I say that? Like there were different sorts of guests invited into the show and they were talking about their lives or problems. And I remember sometimes um, there was a story like a woman who married a Muslim guy from, I don't know where, like uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, or those type of countries. And then like she was telling a story like how she was suffering, how she couldn't even get back to her country, how she was like locked up in there. And uh, all of this scary uh, narrative that was like, uh, I feel like it was shaping the, um, the belief of uh, our society in a way. And I felt like uh, it was kind of uh, influencing me too, in a way. And I felt like, all right, maybe I don't even want to get involved with men like that in the future because I might like uh, suffer. Got it. Yeah, the news makes a makes a huge difference. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. uh, I don't know a lot about this topic, but I am pretty sure there were even books written about this, like uh, some sort of... Uh, diary of a, or like a autobiography of a person who has been to those countries who's been like married to guys like that and then they tell the story of their suffering okay and it's like a warning to young girls in europe to not go that path yeah i know there was a story a few years ago where france disallowed the wearing of hijab in the schools and that was a big story. And I think they still don't allow it. Like school girls, they cannot wear a hijab. Where? France. The whole country. Um, let's shift gears to uh, feminine energy. This is very oh, important. That's a very different topic. <laughs> uh, everything is feminine energy. Um, there's, um, it's important, uh, very important actually, because when, when I was starting my path towards transformation one of the lessons that i learned is that me, that women in the west are becoming more masculine and the gender roles are becoming uh muddled right and confused whereas in the east and specifically eastern europe because uh, all the hot girls are there <laughs> the feminine role still stands. So there were certain countries that, that you know, we, we talked about, you know, amongst the guys, uh, you know, it, it was like uh, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Romania, all the other, you know, Croatia, Serbia, all those countries. And then Brazil, Colombia, right? Some Latin American countries. So we always had this uh, um, feeling that, or, or this uh, expertise, this knowledge uh, thought that, all these countries have women that are still feminine. Whereas in the West, the women are becoming cunts, basically. Right? And that made a lot of guys move to Eastern Europe, or at least travel to Eastern Europe to look for a wife, or to date, or to have their chance of getting laid. Because in general... From my experience, men, especially those who are masculine, don't want a masculine woman hanging out because they're clash. There's a clash, right? Like you remember when we went to Brazilian Zouk, leaders, followers, right? Now, all those women were in the follower side and there was men and women in the masculine, the, the, the leader side. So my question is, Marta, when we'll get to general feminine stuff later but when someone says leaders on this side followers on this side obviously you're a leader i know you're a leader <laughs> right like hands down what made you go to the follower side because i wanted to dance with you got it 
And Got it. Why are you going to be a follower? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so simple as that. What if you were alone? In some dance, somewhere you went with friends, I wasn't there, you were traveling, what would happen? I think I would still go to the follower side because I just don't have uh, much experience with uh, dancing like that. So in order to learn, I would uh, like to follow somebody. But guys who are new at salsa dancing, they always go to the leader side. Unless they're gay. A lot of gay men might go to the followers. I mean, I've been doing this for years, right? Maybe not eight or nine years since I first learned salsa. And I, so many times this happens in class. Leaders, please line up here. Followers, please line up here. And you see girls and guys. But, yes, there would be a one or two guys on the follower side, but they look gay. I don't know. It just looked like that. And on the, leaders, uh, on, the, on the leader side, there would be women, and even women who, it's their first class. They're on the leader side. Yeah, I think it's uh, a matter of personality, probably. Okay. It's n I wouldn't say it's about masculine and feminine so much as just personality. Really? Yeah. So do you believe that masculine energy or, or like the talks that you and Faustina have about masculine and feminine, right? You, you told me about these. Is masculine leadership and feminine follower? You don't think so? I don't think it's that simple. I think uh, it's way more profound than this. I don't think you can simply say masculine is leader and feminine is follower. I would just go deeper into it. Okay, so it's not so simple. All right, so then uh, tell me about this thing about, do you, okay, you, when you first came to Mexico, Tulum, and uh, then you went back to Poland, right? Then you came back to Tulum. Then you visited the States and, and Canada and so on. Do you feel, honestly, any difference in Polish women specifically, or you can maybe even generalize to Eastern Europe and like that area of the world? Versus the Western women you met in Tulum, in Texas, North Carolina, in Montreal. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to say it's very surprising to me what you said about men having that belief that uh, Eastern European women are like that. Because I don't think that's the truth at all. Because all over... Wherever I traveled, I felt like uh, there are all sorts of women as well as there are all sorts of men anywhere. And uh, Warsaw was no different than, I don't know, Berlin or no different than uh, anywhere in Mexico or in the US because you will have women which are more soft and women which are more dominant. And... Uh, if somebody is really going to travel to Poland or uh, Ukraine, if, uh, if that's safe right now, or Romania or wherever, I think they might get disappointed, honestly, because I met a lot of strong personality women in Poland. And uh, yeah, I don't see any difference at all. Really? Yeah. And I feel like maybe those Eastern European countries are a bit slower at uh, going in that direction of uh, women kind of becoming uh, equal in all sorts of ways to men. But uh, I feel like we are still getting there. And one, one example would be me going to vet school where you had, uh, when we were starting, I believe, uh, probably I'll get these numbers wrong, but uh, it's just like an estimation. Maybe, um, let's say 200 people were starting out and we had like 170 women and 30 men. So it was like, uh, even if 
veterinary medicine is a field that requires you to be strong physically because you would be dealing with like horses and uh, cattle and all those farm animals and uh, doing physical work. So despite that, we had a majority of women and not so many men willing to study. So that tells you something for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. And I even remember there were some uh, some teachers saying like, uh, what a surprise it is that we have majority of women every year coming to vet school. And in the past, it was not like that at all. It was like a very manly uh, profession. And it has changed in the recent years only. Yeah. Maybe in the recent 20 years. I guess... I want to ask you about emotion then, because let me tell you uh, about one of my friends in New York, Nicole. I remember one time uh, we were in the metro and um, she was working for some finance company, right? Working all the time. Crazy. And uh, I told her uh, she rarely be she rarely had an expression on her face. She was very like like that, Un unless like uh, it was a joke. So she would laugh, but very expressionless girl and one time i told her um because i know the new york vibe i know how new york people are sometimes they don't have much emotion i said nicole what what is your thing about with emotion like you seem tough so in terms of vulnerability and emotion and being soft what, what's going on so this is what she told me I still remember, it's like seven years later. She goes, uh, Farhan, I have devoted 15 minutes of my day for emotion. So at a certain time during the day, towards the evening, I give myself 15 minutes to be emotional, and then I suppress emotion again, because in this world, emotion will make me weak, and I will not be able to rise in the ranks like oh, wow. all the New York men. Right. And this girl was like a model and like she had a good job. And I mean, everything, maybe she had too much makeup on, but like, you know, she had everything going for her and um, nice person, very good personality, smart person, but not expressing emotion. So if, when I talk about feminine energy, right. And, and I will definitely disagree with you here because from my personal experience yes poland and ukraine and romania has strong women for sure i mean when i was in ukraine in kiev i had you know there was these women at the creative quarter the co-working space i mean they were badass savages right they were like ceos of companies and they were just like doing calls and doing sales but when you spoke to them they had shyness they would blush they would smile, laugh. They understood the relationship between feminine and masculine. I felt that. But you can feel it in Mexico too. I can feel it in Mexico. But what I'm saying is there is a tendency in, for example, in Montreal, okay? The little girl that is in every woman, sometimes I would never see that. I would never see that in a girl, right? The dates I went on or whatever, right? I would be with a girl and I never felt that feminine awe, you know, that like cuddly thing. It was more like, like it's like talking to a boy at times. I didn't feel that thing. And it's not just me, right? If you if you talk to, for example, my mom, even she'll tell you this thing. Now, again, I don't know what's truth and what's not truth. We're just having a conversation. But there is definitely a theory, a very strong theory, that there is a tendency in the West, and, and again, Mexico, you can consider West, East, you know, whatever you like. But the tendency is there is a masculine shift 
And I'm not saying what's good or what's bad at all. I'm not making a moral judgment. But what I'm saying is the separation, the polarity between men and women is less in the West. That's what I'm saying. So the polarity that I see between my mom and my dad, right? That polarity that like if my mom is confused about something, she's like, okay, I'm going to let dad handle it. That thing I don't see in the Western couples today. I don't see it. I see it as more, uh, um, there's a clash between the, and I mean, look, very. Uh, uh, let's take something to, to child rearing, right? To, to growing up children. In in the same Harry Harlow book, The Love and Good Love at Goon Park, very clearly, one of the chapters said that the family structure is very complex. It's not just a nuclear family: mom, dad, you know, brother, sister, dog. No, for evolution, for the human mind. For culture to develop, there has to be a complex, dynamic family environment. Uncles, aunts, grandmother, grandfather, guests coming in the house all the time, different, uh, different, different people uh, uh, that they visit somewhere, right? There has to be this dynamics of family environment. So, in the West... We don't have that. We don't have joint families. Right? We don't... So... But I feel like there are many people who are going back to that traditional model because they see that it's not really the way what you've just explained. So even in the West... You cannot say everybody is like that or everybody is not like that. You see what I mean? Just look just look at the just look at normal normal structure, right? You have a house. When we went to Ulysses for the first time, you saw all those houses like the Sim City houses you were talking about, right? Those houses have one family living in each of those house houses. Their their old parents either they're living on their own or they are living in a nursing home. Or whatever, right? I just feel that in Poland as well, it's the same. Well, Poland, I mean, Poland is a NATO country. It's 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 westernized. Poland, Poland is this one very one of the few countries that are like that. But I that don't it, think Ukraine, for example, is much different. You're telling me that Ukraine's family structure is like the U.S. It's close to Poland, I would say. You don't see a difference between Ukraine and Poland in this case? You see it very similar? Well, I don't know that many families from Ukraine to, okay. to form an opinion about this. But when I visited Ukraine in my life, I didn't think like, oh, we are so much different I thought it was pretty similar to Poland. In fact, uh, in Kiev, when I visited in 2019, I think even the metro is way more advanced than the Warsaw one. Yeah, Kiev metro is very nice. I yeah. remember traveling yeah, so a lot. It didn't seem like a third world country, right? So mm. there's not that much of a difference in my opinion. Yeah, something more to think about here because... Um, Maybe the education system um, is not so good because I, I know that many people from Ukraine come to Poland to get their education. But I think it had more to do with the fact that uh, they have to pay for their education and only like the best people get, uh, get it for free. Whereas in Poland, they could get a free education. I think... It's not about the quality of the education as much as having to pay for it. Got it. Um, shift shifting gears to something else that's an important topic, um, and and feel free if you don't want to share anything uh, regarding this, you don't have to. It's completely up to you. It is the guilt and shame of needing a therapist. Now this is a 
this is something that maybe it's a way better now, but when I was growing up, I always felt shame for like, oh, I need help. I need help from somebody. And even um, Ayub, our last, uh, he had the same thought, right? And Ayub got therapy as well. And he talked about his therapy. And when he was growing up and when I was growing up and, and still now a little bit, um, very little now, but way, way back then a lot, I had this shame and inferiority towards seeking help, seeking therapy, right? Especially for maybe it's something in our culture where men are not supposed to express emotion, not supposed to cry, so on and so forth. I remember whenever I would tell my mom that, oh, mo my mom, uh, or hey, mom, this uh, movie was so, so, so nice, so like soft and sad and, and emotional that I cried. My mom seemed insecure. Like she, she showed insecurity in her face. Like, oh my God, my son is weak. So the ability to show emotion between men and women, what is your take on, is it okay for men to show emotion, to seek therapy? And also, same thing for women. And, and is there a difference between those genders? Like, is it is is a man seeking therapy seems different than a woman seeking therapy? To me, no, not at all. I don't see any difference because I feel like we're all human. We all struggle and it's okay to seek for help if you have to. Me personally, I never felt any shame or guilt uh, when I decided to uh, start my therapy. Never. And uh, another thing is that I didn't really talk about this openly. So probably until this day, many people who were somewhat close to me, maybe they don't even know that I was going to therapy because it was kind of personal. Uh, but uh, if somebody found out, I wouldn't have guilt or shame. It's more about maybe I didn't really want to talk about it while I was going through it and uh, didn't want to really have to um, come up with like an explanation uh, or just not really wanted to dive into it. But I don't think there is any reason to have shame or guilt. And in fact, I would always say go to therapy, at least try it. And it might not be so easy for many people because there is also a lot of uh, maybe trouble concerning finding a good therapist that you would kind of have like a good chemistry with. And I was lucky because I found a really good therapist uh, second time. Uh, first time, um, the first lady I went to, she actually uh, told me to go to her friend, uh, to her colleague. And her colleague was uh, really, really good because it was like a different uh, type of uh, therapy. Um, the first one was like a psychoanalysis, which was not really well suited for what I was going through at that moment. And uh, then eventually I started, um, how do you call that? Cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, something like that. I don't know the English name. Um, so it was uh, very aligned with what I was looking for and I was very happy and uh, I felt that it was really helping me and I felt uh, like tangible results um, while I was in that therapy, I felt like it was working. I felt like uh, every session gives me tools to deal with my uh, anxiety at that time. And uh, yeah, it was really, really awesome. And I am so happy that I did that. I feel like it was one of the best decisions of my life to go to therapy. Even when at that time I was not like, at my lowest ever and I was not like uh, suffering so much like uh, 
I thought, okay, I, I am fine. I'm good with my mental health. I only have this one problem that I want to fix. So I, I was kind of like, uh, just, ha just had a task, one task. And it wasn't like, a, oh, I want to overall change my mental structure. Uh, it was more about just fixing this one problem that I had. And uh, even with this kind of approach, when I didn't feel like, oh, it's super, super necessary for me to go to therapy, I'm very happy that I did that. And uh, at some point, uh, I was talking to my therapist and we both agreed, okay, that's it. Uh, you don't need therapy anymore. You're free. <laughs> You're free to go. You have these tools now. Uh, you know what to do in case of anxiety. You You know very well how to cope with it. So... Yeah, but I'm still very happy that I did that. And uh, if anyone out there is thinking, maybe I don't have those that many issues, maybe it's not so deep, I'm not like having suicidal thoughts. If you have a chance, if you have time, if you have uh, money for that, I would say it's totally worth it. But also don't get discouraged if uh, first time you go to therapy and you feel like uh, it's not really what you thought it would be it's okay to change your therapist as well it might take time you might get lucky or not but I I would say it's totally worth it and no matter if you are a female or male got it as you know um, we are interested in trauma we have these books here on the shelf and and listen to Dr. Paul Conti and Gabor Mate and others the trauma that it ha that you had before you went to therapy. Can you talk a little bit about what that fear was? I, I don't know if I'm comfortable to talk about this. Okay, so you don't have to. Perhaps let's generalize it, right? Generalize fear and take the example that you had and let's see if we can dissect it, right? Doesn't matter what the specific fear was. What part of therapy or what was the take-home message that allowed you to face the fear yeah so i would say i had uh i don't know if we talked about this on the previous episode i think we touched uh, on that a little bit uh so i just had a lot of fear of doing things that i was not used to doing so I feel maybe it has to do with the fact that I was a really good student uh, when I was uh, growing up. I was always the best and or like uh, close to being the best. And uh, I never had any issues with studying. And then if I had to do something at some point in my life that I didn't feel like I would excel at and I felt like I could struggle there was a lot of anxiety and I didn't want to do new things. I didn't want to try new things. And I wanted, I just had the need to run away from things that seemed hard to do. It, and uh, then I, I have noticed that it was becoming harder and harder for me to do these things the more I was running away from them. So my goal in my therapy was to stop being afraid to stop having this fear that was kind of uh, paralyzing me because I knew I cannot live like that. And uh, the therapy helped me with exposing myself to um, issues that were uncomfortable, to situations that were uncomfortable. And uh, it, was, it was quite complex, but the takeaway is that you just have to go and do it, expose yourself, and then in the end, it will become easier and easier uh, because of the repetition. The more you do it, uh, the more used to it you will get, and then eventually it will stop triggering the fear, and uh, the fear will just not show up, and uh, I would be able to live normally, which uh, I believe happened. And I still have uh, this kind of fear reaction whenever I do something that is new to me that's still with me but thanks to the therapy I know that whenever I feel a fear this is the reason why I have to do it because I can then overcome this 
and uh, then I can just become good with it. One thing you said earlier today, and this links to something I read in Seneca today, and it links to what I heard on Jocko Willink, th- this Marine guy, uh, Navy SEAL guy. What, uh, uh, where did you hear that? Um, so, so this morning... Uh, I listened to Andrew Huberman and Jocko Willink. It's a, Jocko Willink is a ex uh, Navy SEAL, not a Marine. Sorry, Navy SEAL. And um, I heard it in their podcast this morning. And when I was shitting today, I read it in Seneca. And you said it today, so there I even wrote it down. Um, and the and and all three of them said, when you encounter something very intense, that is a traumatic experience, you don't necessarily want to deal with it right then and there take a step back recover from it and when you're ready look back at it from this perspective and what jo- and, and seneca said something similar and then jocko willing said it, it might have been an epicurus quote because you know that's how he pays his debt right to to lucilius but and then Jocko said, sometimes when you encounter a really hard situation, like in war, because he's been in war many times, you have to change perspective, change the point of view, and look at it from a, a, a direction that nobody's looking at, and then you get the answer. So that that was uh, something you said. What did I say? I don't think uh, I said anything you said, that relates to that. You said um, two or three topics ago that you weren't something that... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, about like uh, different ethnicities, right? I said like uh, I got exposure and I got a different perspective and now I look at uh, things differently. Yeah, yeah. Some Something like that. But even... Even if you, uh, even in our discussions, whenever you, um, whenever you go into a traumatic episode in the past, right? You you go into that. You only want to go into it when you're ready, right? Like even in the podcast, you will discuss when you are ready. Why? Because you need to still heal from what happened before you can discuss it. So. Another thing I want to ask you is about fear is this. Lots of fear is innate, right? Like some people have fear of heights or fear of spiders. It's not like someone taught you fear of fear, a uh, fear of heights, fear of spiders or whatever, right? Like some kids are scared of spider the first time they see a spider, right? Arachnophobia, it's some innate thing. Whereas other kids aren't scared of spiders, right? But then there are other fears. Go ahead. Yeah, do you think that this might have some genetic compound? I think so. Yeah, I, I think, think so. I read about this. I think so. I think so. Um, like, you remember the study when John Watson, he scared a little baby for, for the rat, right? Because he would... So John Watson is the behaviorist. Um, oh, yeah, I remember the study. Right? Watsonian yeah. psychology. It's called mm-hmm. Watsonian psychologist. And he was very different from Harry Harlow. They were clashing, but... Watson believed that with behavior and with nurture, you can do anything. He's the one who said, give me, uh, you know, 12 children, whatever, when they're born, and I will make each of them exactly what I want because I will program program them since childhood. And, And again, now we know this is not true. This is bullshit. But what Watson did with, with a little child, I think his name was uh, Albert or Little Albert or something. They named him. Um, he, whenever the child would see a rat, the child would cuddle. He's like, oh, cute rat. Ah, yeah. play with the, you know, pet the rat. And then what Watson did is every time the child saw the rat, boom, like this this big, horrible sound. And the, the, the child like got, got like that. Every time he saw the rat, this sound. Every time he saw the rat, this sound. And he wanted to see, can we classical condition a human? We know we can do it in chickens. We know we can do it in dogs. Can we do it in a human? And after this, that kid became scared of the rat. Now, 
they never took this fear away from the kid. He was always scared of rats for his whole life. They, they, they ruined this kid's life. But if the kid one day realized that this experiment was done to him, should he try to eliminate this fear even though somebody put it in him? Should he spend his life trying to get rid of this fear when it's not even real? I think so. Why? Well... Are we talking only about the rats or any other kind of fear that could... Let's start uh, with the rats. He's never going to see a rat in his life. Who cares? Why should he try to do exposure therapy and spend six months trying to get rid of this fear? Why should he care? Well, I would care just because I would be curious. Like, how can I fix myself in a way? Like, how can I become better? How can I improve my life? Right? I see it from this kind of perspective. So curiosity. You would want to explore. Maybe you can learn something about yourself. Maybe you can learn something about fear itself. Exactly. So maybe it's a blessing? I'm not sure if it's a blessing, but it uh, it makes me think of, because uh, I'm uh, quite interested in uh, behavioral medicine, and veterinary behavioral medicine. So you have a lot of... Uh, for example, dogs who are scared of storm or who are scared of really loud uh, sounds. And uh, obviously you could be like, oh, whatever, uh, we will just uh, be with the dog. Uh, you know, so many dogs have the phobia of fireworks. Um, so many people like do the firework shows during New Year's uh, Eve. I don't know if you're like uh, familiar with that sure. custom, uh, but it's like pretty common in Poland. Um, or even here in Mexico, when you have like holidays, people would do the fireworks. So many dogs have this kind of phobia. And uh, even, uh, as I mentioned, storm um, phobia. So you could be like, oh, we can just uh, give the dog the medicine each time it happens, or we can just uh, stay with the dog, make sure he's okay. Or you can try to fix it. Because you could think, oh, it's not a big deal. Just like you said with the rat, oh, maybe I'll never see a rat in my life. You could be like, oh, uh, we will just stay with the dog and make sure he is okay. But it's really relevant as to the quality of the life, right? When you know there is this kind of fear that causes huge discomfort. And there is no doubt that there is something damaged, right, in the mental health. So I would always choose to try to repair it and fix it. Do you think sometimes people become spiritual and hippie because they don't face the fears? I never thought about this this way. Let me give you an example. I've thought about this a lot over the years. So um, I remember one time in Tampa, we used to go to the Buddhist temple every like Sunday, you know, free food and all that. So we would, uh, me, Jibin, a couple of other people, we, we drove to uh, the Tampa Buddhist temple. It was great. And then um, I saw some monks there. Right, some monks hanging out and uh, wearing their their uniform and eating vegetarian, like the Dalai Lama, right? Orange uniform, whatever. And I thought to myself, I said, "What if growing up, these, assuming they didn't become monks when they were babies, assuming they became monks later, what if the pain of the world is so strong?" the fear that they have towards the world is so big that their brain has no option but to become spiritual. So you can imagine someone like a, 
take someone like Marcus Aurelius. Yeah, you haven't read Meditations yet, but you know Stoicism, you know Seneca. Now, take a look at someone like Seneca, right? Seneca's life at that moment when he wrote meditation, uh, when he wrote uh, letters, he was older. It was it was like his last work, right? Now, let's say he had fear of something in that old age. I don't know the fear of uh, fighting someone, for example, like like he wasn't good at fighting. Let's say like physical fight. If his brain convinces him that he's a philosopher and he's stoic because embracing that philosophy is good for him because now he doesn't have to face the fear of fighting, right? I believe that the human brain is so clever that we adopt certain spiritual principles in life like meditation, plant medicine, um, going on retreats, becoming present, because facing the fear is so hard. I have this belief. Because I know, like for example, I have a lot of friends in Dallas that growing up, they had, they had fear, they had a lot of fear. Like, you know, fear of uh, white people, right? Fear of uh, talking to, to girls that are not their own religion. They had the fear of making friends with uh, black people, for example, right? Because, oh, my, they might get, might get robbed or killed or something. You know, there was this fear, right? But then, if you start believing that, oh, I have this spiritual leader. And if these people don't follow the spiritual leader then I shouldn't talk to them because they won't, we won't have anything in common. We won't have a common ground. So because of this belief, the brain tricks them into not facing the fear that they have. And I really, really think this is an important point because a lot of spiritual people you see, this is something that we talked about this morning at breakfast with Jordan Peterson, right? He goes... Uh, the guy who doesn't want to desire or do an action for his neighbor, the, 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 you know, his neighbor's wife, is because of the, because if he's like, oh, I'm, I'm very religious, you know, I'm very religious here, and so I, I believe in God, so I don't do all these things. Or you're just scared. You just have the fear, right? So how do you distinguish between philosophy, being in the present moment, doing meditation, and facing the real fear you have? Well, uh, now that you mentioned this, I feel like uh, it's kind of even the point of philosophy, right? To direct people's thinking into like uh, the right uh, direction. Because even when right now I read Epictetus and he keeps on repeating that the only thing that you should be ever concerned uh, with uh, are the things that are within your control, which is, uh, he, he mentions, it's the correct use of impressions. So it's like uh, the thoughts that we have, he calls impressions. And then um, he says that the the main thing that you have to do in life is to distinguish which thoughts are worth um, acting upon and which thoughts you should let go of. And he said anything that is external, which uh, also is your body, uh, anybody that is like uh, anybody you meet, uh, wealth, uh, money, uh, your job, this is all external, this is uh, not up to you, you should not care about this. So he also kind of might be lying to himself, right? Like, I wanna, I don't want to really get into it because it's too hard, because I have a fear. And uh, yeah, what do you think about this? I will uh, let Nassim Talib answer this question. Okay. <laughs> um, so... One of Nassim Taleb's big notions is 
options. Options. He's big on this. What does that mean? As an options trader for you know 25 years, 20, 25 years in New York, I am not uh, any expert on option trading, but I have friends who are really good at this stuff. And basically what happens is at a certain point when you buy some option, you have the option to sell. Uh, it's like a put. I don't know. There's like different terminology. Anyway, so Nassim says that in life, you must have the option. For example, let's say you're poor. Okay. Now, because you're poor, you tell yourself, oh, you know what? I don't really care about a cool car. No, I don't really care about the trip to Paris. No, I don't really care about uh, getting all organic food. I don't really care about, uh, you know, giving my parents a, th this gift. I don't really care. Now, your mind is so clever that it will convince you that you don't care. So take a step back and ask yourself, are you forced to have that perspective or do you have the option, right? So I remember when I was having a discussion with my mom, this is three, four years ago. And uh, I was, you know, I read Nassim Taleb since like 2014, I've been reading him. And one of the things he said is, you must have the option and then choose not to do it or choose to do it. And the same thing Jordan Peterson teaches us. He always teaches us this. It's like, if someone asks Jordan, what is the one thing that men should do? He says, become a monster. Become a monster. That's the one tip he gives. What does that mean? Climb the dominance hierarchy. Become successful. Become powerful. Become dangerous. And then choose to not hurt people choose to tell the truth choose to not backstep choose to be grateful and give charity take that option but have the option so someone like marcus aurelius who is a king has the option to either kill people and take take power and, and do whatever the hell he wants, or read, philosophize, be generous, be kind. Marcus had the option. Seneca had the option. Because Seneca was the richest person in the Roman Empire. 300 million dinars. More money than anyone, by far. I don't know if Epictetus was like that. Well, he used to be a slave. Then he became free, and uh, I don't, I don't know about his wealth status. But he also talks a lot about Socrates, as do other Stoics as well and other philosophers. So I wonder what you think about this, Socrates. Uh, you know the way he died, right? I do. And uh, when when he was in the court, he so he is very often uh, discussed uh, by Stoics, and he is like an example of uh, the good character um, that all these Stoics want, want to be like or want to become like. So uh, they always say he didn't care about his body and uh, about being killed. He was like, okay, uh, you can take my body from me, but you are still not killing me. So he just chose to let it all go, just like that. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is big. So from because he yeah. went so deep into it that none of this mattered. You can be like, oh, maybe he had wealth, maybe he had this, he had that. But Socrates went one step ahead and he's like, that doesn't even concern me. I'm above all of this. And uh, I think I read probably yesterday that during this court, session 
when he was already uh, found guilty, um, I think it's called impiety. Yeah, am I saying this correctly? Uh, then he said something like, I don't know if it's true. Uh, he said something like, okay, so now what are you going to sentence me to? Are you going to give me uh, free meals, meals until the rest of my life uh, on the coast of the society? And then he made those people even more furious and even more uh, like uh, wanting to kill him, wanting to have him killed. Because he he was still like uh, making a joke out of it, he didn't get the seriousness of the situation, even though he was about to get killed. Do you know this or not? I do know. Yeah, um, Socrates. There's the apology. We should get. We the, should get. We should, uh, we'll, get him. we'll get him. Yeah, there I've are read a lot him of already, but we got to get him. I actually have because I have had them um, I had them hard copy and I gave everything to Kyle in Toronto I had everything in Toronto yeah so you know how Seneca keeps uh, quoting uh, Epicurus uh, I feel like uh, Epictetus keeps mentioning Socrates like uh, every wow. other page <laughs> and the fact that he never wrote anything yeah yeah it's huge man huge it, it gave me tears honestly when I was reading um, his his uh, trial and um, when the guy came to jail to free him and gave him an offer that I can help you flee uh, prison, and Socrates said, "Nope, my time has come. I'm 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 down to go. I'm I'm ready to go." And uh, there was the apology, <laughs> and it was it was very um, uh, sacrilegious because in his apology he basically made fun of like the, everyone like i apologize for telling the truth you know yeah. i apologize for uh uh helping all these young men become you know better and and more more pious and more 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 free um yeah man i, I think we i think we have to read that again because it's a beautiful stuff. yeah i would love to read that because uh even epictetus he keeps saying that which, which is also super, super interesting to me because we are reading those ancient books and it seems like these people have such a great fear of death. And this has been with me ever since I can, rem ever since I can remember. I've always had a fear of death. They do or they don't? They do. So that's why they keep like trying to console themselves, trying to uh, convince themselves what to do in order to not have this fear and uh, Epictetus keeps saying, like, uh, death is inevitable. It will happen. You cannot ex escape it. But what you can escape is the fear of death. So he touches upon the fear topic, too. Uh, but it's mostly about the fear of dying. Yeah, Marcus Aurelius, too. Yeah, but All it's, it's so, so interesting to me, right? Like uh, Death is at your doorstep, yeah. right? always. So imagine more than 2,000 years ago, this topic was so important to those people who are like so different than us right now, but still we have like uh, the same fear, still. Yeah. Ayub discussed this in the last podcast. He said, uh, basically all fears come down to fear of death. Fear of dying, all of them, public speaking, heights, blah, blah. It's all about fear of dying. Yeah. And it's not necessarily fear of dying physically, but fear of letting something go, right? Like yeah. fear of height could be physical dying because you could fall and die. But fear of public speaking is that you are, you are letting go of the person who is shy, right? It's like when you speak in front of people, they can make fun of you. And that person who was first immune to getting made fun of because he now was... Now it's super vulnerable. It's the vulnerability. Yeah. What, what makes people like Jordan Peterson or Imran Khan? Do you know Imran Khan? I'm not sure. Imran Khan is the former prime minister of Pakistan. Oh, I don't know him. Yeah. And uh, recently he had a assassination attempt on him. Uh, basically, he was in his, uh, it, it was a parade. And so there was a truck. He was on top of the truck and he was speaking to people, uh, you know, with a megaphone or whatever. And he was talking about um, corruption 
and what is happening in Pakistan about the mafia, so on and so forth. And he was doing his political moves, right? And uh, there was a two people in the in the audience who had guns, and uh, they both tried to shoot him. And what happened is when the, sh- the, the 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 gun went up, one of the other people saw it, and he like tackled the guy. So as the guy was being tackled, he shot, and he, and Imran Khan got shot in the foot, uh, in the leg. So he was injured, but he is still alive. And in Imran Khan's interview with Pierce Morgan, Pierce said, are you afraid of dying? Now, it's, it's something different from stoicism. A little different. Maybe it's the same. You, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But he said, my death is already written. Allah, God, will... That take me when it's my time. So I'm not afraid because that is up to God. My death is up to Him. So if I was going to die at that moment, I would die. So and, be it. Right. And, and if I got saved, well, that's up to God's will. Right. And in Islam, we always have this thing, inshallah, inshallah, which means may, if God pleases, if God wants, if yeah. God pleases. I think it's very aligned with Stoicism and also with uh, religions like uh, Christianity. Even uh, my mom is a fan of uh, St. Augustine. Right. I feel like it's uh, very aligned to it. Also, the Jobs story, I would love to reread that. I remember that from high school. So I've been mentioning that to you for uh, s- such a long time, but I would love to reread that because I feel like it's just uh, the story of uh, humbling oneself and uh, basically letting God decide your fate, which is uh, very freeing, right? When you like, okay, whatever you call it, the God, fate, the universe, you just let go of the responsibility of deciding your fate. Like, okay, I'll do my best, but in the end, it's not up to me, the final result. You know what I mean? I, I do know this concept. Um, again, it's the notion of, are weak people religious? Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is something that Nietzsche would say. That yeah. morality, ethics is for weak people. Yeah. If you're weak, you're moral. If you're strong, you don't need to have justice. You can break all the rules. Yeah, and then also you have uh, this link to happiness, right? Like, uh, are religious people more happy and satisfied with their lives because they have religion? And I think that's something that you mentioned to me once yep. about like uh, the prayer um, being very important in like uh, uh, facilitating the mental well-being. I don't know if uh, if I'm correct right now. Religious people are definitely happier, and religious people pray. And you know, prayer is like the definition of being faith. You know, having yeah, faith, yeah, you got to pray. I think uh, in one of the Huberman's uh, episodes, uh, I believe it was the one with uh, Doctor uh, Gina Po. Um, they are mentioned the practice of yoga nidra uh, or the uh, non sleep depressed as uh, he calls it yeah is, is that yeah, yeah nsdr yeah, yeah. Uh, and then she said that you can practice that or you can even practice prayers in order to calm yourself down so it can be meditation it can be prayer uh, whatever that is it all eventually will bring you the same effect to just give you peace and yeah. like internal state of peace. I know they've done a study where they saw the therapy benefits between priests and psychiatrists or psycho. I think it was psychologists actually. Mm. And uh, it was the same. It was not significantly different. So the conclusion of the study was priests are like psychologists. Like you can get a PhD or you can become a priest. Yeah. You're going to have the same benefit on people. Yeah, because in many cases, ultimately, it comes down to having somebody that will listen to you, right? Which I feel like uh, uh-huh. in many people's lives, 
these days, it might be super rare to have somebody that will actually hold space for you and will truly listen with engagement and with empathy. And I think you also discussed that with uh, Catherine in your recent podcast. And I just uh, finished uh, listening to this one. It was really great. So I heard you were talking about the, the importance of uh, listening to people and how she's got that gift of just being able to listen and uh, give empathy, which I, I truly believe is true as well. Yeah, this uh, reminds me of um, going back to the Harry Harlow book, The Love at Goon Park. When they looked at the, st the, the studies of where they compared the children's IQ, where they were with the foundlings. So the foundlings are basically like daycare, but like not good daycare. It's like okay. people aren't, kids aren't getting hugged or played with. They're just, just, just there, just sitting there. They're not being listened to versus foster care. Mm -hmm. And foster care is when it's actually parents who take care of these kids. And uh, it was interesting because the, no the notion in the 50s and 60s was that kids should stay in the hospital for a while because, you know, germs and they need, we need to keep them sterile and all that. And then at a certain age, they were ready to be taken by foster parents. And that was the wrong method because the more kids are kept isolated and in the sterile environment basically the more annoying they're going to become or the more ugly in terms of emotion they're going to become and now these parents don't want them right so they, there was a big mistake that was happening in the 50s and 60s in america where imagine you're a, you want to adopt a child but they're all like annoying little brats and the reason they've become annoying and maybe even autistic or, or a little, you know, like psychotic is because they're being isolated in these foundlings or these hospitals for so long, right? So they wanted the parents to wait, but then the theory came about that, no, the foster parents need to adopt these kids very early and give these kids love very early. And your notion of listening, this is big because in the Harlow studies, he did a, a very different types of mothers, right? One mother was, uh, you know, with the, the terry cloth mother, you know, the very, very cushioned mother. One was a mother that was a wire mother, but he also made mothers which would literally have these bumps and the bumps would come out and the monkey would go flying, right? It was like a, a mother that is violent, like it beats the shit out of you. So, um, what the conclusion of one of these studies was that the attention that a parent gives is the key to the child's upbringing. Attention, right? So they, they mentioned, and this goes back to our nuclear family discussion, that if, if a parent is giving the child to daycare, and if it's not a good daycare, then the child could end up in misery, right? Because if the parent, imagine you go to work at eight, you give your child to daycare, you come home at six, pick them up from daycare, they're with strangers, and they're, you know, at least they're playing around with people, but then they may not be listened to. Now they come home, and now you're stressed, you have to wash the dishes, you have to cook the kid is crying you're like dismissing him if a kid continues to grow like that not being listened to not being listened to not being listened to what's going to happen he's going to feel that nobody cares for him what he has to say doesn't matter nobody's listening and this is happening a lot yeah yeah especially i feel like in our generation now uh, people who are growing up um, in many cases, we come from families with that kind of model, right? Where both of the parents are working and they don't really have time to be, just be with the kid, right? So, yeah, this, this is a topic that is very interesting to me. I haven't really read a lot about 
um, how a certain type of upbringing affects the children. And I would for sure love to get to know uh, more about this. But uh, yeah, I feel like it's a very important thing. And I also feel like more and more people are becoming aware of that these days compared to the past. And also, we just pertaining to this, we discussed the uh, different attachment styles a couple of days ago, or maybe even yesterday. Yeah. John Bowlby, uh, the UK scientist, he, and, and people still follow this to today, he had different models of attachment styles. So secure attachment, insecure attachment, and then there's uh, maladaptive, uh, there's like two parts of insecure attachments, maladaptive, and then there's another one I don't remember now. But essentially, it's when the mother goes away, how does the child behave by himself and with a stranger, right? So you can imagine you're in a room by yourself with your mom. You're, you're playing with toys. The mom leaves. You chase the mom. And then you start crying because the mom is gone. The door is closed. You're alone with a stranger, some, some lady who's an experimenter. Crying, crying, crying. The experimenter picks you up. You're crying even more. Like, who the hell is this person? Like, what is this energy that I'm feeling? Where's my mother? Right? You're feeling worse. Mother comes in. Now you stop crying. You go to your mother. Or you might look away. You might hit your mother. There's all these different attachment styles. Do you think that it would be, it would be beneficial to see adults by their attachment styles because what they found is the way we have our attachment style to our mother is the same way we will be in relationships that's interesting you didn't tell me that right yeah i, I didn't tell you until now yeah we didn't we, if i then we would never get any work done if we just talk all day yeah but uh, that's super interesting just like uh, when you mentioned that it brought me back to this situation when i got lost in an uh, amusement park when I was a little kid and I was like uh, crying and thinking like it's the end of the world, like what's going to happen to me? I'll never find my parents again. Yeah, it was really, really a difficult situation for me. Yeah. Really a lot of uh, panic and shock. Yeah. Just because I was not with my mom and not with my family for a little while. Such an interesting thing that for me, the more I read, the more self-aware I get, the more I can take a step back from the fears, the anxieties, the insecurities, like I still have them. Yeah. But seeing them and, and embracing them and accepting them it becomes so much easier. Yeah. It's still hard. Though. Again, it gives you another perspective, just as we discussed, right? Uh, a while ago, you get a new perspective. And also, I feel like the more I read, the more I still need to read because I feel like I know nothing. And I still want to know more and more and more. Yeah. I want to, one of the things I, I wrote here is um, Bollywood, as you read it in the beginning. Um, so Bollywood culture has a certain deep soul for me because I grew up watching it. We're very much into the vibe of Bollywood culture. When you watch Bollywood movies, you have English subtitles, I know, but you're still getting some energy and stuff. Yeah, and I'm still learning. You're still learning <laughs> the words, you're, you're getting there. Tell me, is Bollywood, does it have anything special or anything interesting from your perspective, because you first time you're being exposed to it, that I wouldn't really catch, because I've always known it. Is there anything interesting that you saw which was different from what you see in everyday life? Well, there are a lot of things like that. First of all, it's super colorful. Uh, the language is different. But I feel like uh, I also have... Uh, I don't want to say like uh, tolerance, but um, it's all pretty normal to me because when I was growing up, I always liked to uh, 
even watch like Korean movies or Japanese movies or uh, you know I'm from Poland and I was watching American mu- mu- uh, movies so that's pretty exotic too uh, so I always had this curiosity about uh, movies from different countries uh, I just didn't really watch Bollywood when I was young but uh, I definitely heard of it and now that we are watching it I feel that I feel like there is a uh, more playfulness to it compared to Western movies, um, as far as uh, it goes for the movies that I've seen. But also, one thing that surprised me, and I I think I mentioned that to you maybe yesterday or two days ago, uh, whenever it was, that um, the topic of arranged marriages is like huge in those Bollywood movies. I know it's like from maybe 20 or 30 years ago, some of those movies that we watch. But it's like uh, almost every movie has this topic of a, there's a arranged marriage and the girl or the guy, they don't want it and they're trying to like get away from it. And there's like this huge um, connection with the parents it's always like, oh, the parents have a lot to say and uh, they make the final decision and uh, the young people, they, they cannot do anything, basically. Like, they are just... Uh, they, they have to do what their parents say. So this was, like, a pretty interesting thing because I feel like in the Western culture, it's not like that at all. Uh, your parents will most likely not force you to do anything. Uh I, I say in most cases. And uh, in Bollywood movies, it's like a very common theme that the parents say one thing and the kids don't really agree with that, but they still have to follow and they, they will rebel. And that's that's the plot of the movie, right? Yes. Yeah. I never thought of it until you mentioned it because I was just used to this type of culture. Yeah, but you agree. Pretty much in every movie, there is yeah. this like... Uh, Parents, kids, conflict. Yes, 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 yes. And I think one of the things that Bollywood wanted to do and probably still wants to do, like, you know, Hollywood also has these agendas and they want to brainwash people in a certain way. Bollywood is no different. Because growing up watching Bollywood movies, I had a certain impression of what love is or what uh, power is or what... uh, kindness is what play is right what strength is what is masculine what is feminine i had all these ideas from bollywood and in the real world that doesn't happen it's not that cinderella story type stuff in the real world so i at a certain point i just stopped watching bollywood oh so it had that kind of impact on you oh yeah interest for sure I mean, I was totally into Bollywood. And as a kid, without any real world experience, just studying all day, you're just trying to get A's. You're not really traveling or just being stuck in one place. Everyone around you is like you. Everyone is like, you know, nerdy style. No one's really working out or or doing healthy, cool shit. No one's traveling. No one's, uh, you know, uh, reading cool books, right? It's like, oh, okay, let's, let's read these books because they told us to, right? There's no curiosity. Oh, let's, hey, let's see how these batteries work. Or, hey, let's go figure out uh, how to write code for this video game. It was none of that stuff. It was very like, follow, follow, follow. So the little exposure that I had to the real world was overshadowed by the big exposure I had to Bollywood or to TV shows that are part of Bollywood. And so this, you know, the Shah Rukh Khan type romantic hero was like stuff I believed. I mean, I'm not saying I thought I thought it's like a girl thing to believe no, in movies. Not That's at so all. Funny. Not at all. I still remember <laughs> when I saw Titanic with one of my buddies in Dallas. Um, I don't remember who it was anymore, but um, I went home. That movie made such an impression on me. I went home. I called him, and we spoke to an hour. Uh, spoke for an hour about Titanic. And um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a personality. I'm not sure. But uh, movies do make an impact on me. 
They really do. Deep impact. Um, but okay, so I see the arranged marriage. Do you do you believe from the friends that you have, guy friends, girlfriends, um, that there is a struggle to find a mate, and you can go to the birth gap documentary or the the the, the podcast with Jordan Peterson and that dude who made birth gap. Um, from your own firsthand experience with your friends, talking to your friends, seeing people, what is your take on women delaying their birth of a child into their 40s or mid-30s or late 30s, which a lot of women do? And what it, what is your culture telling you? Well, it's hard for me to say much about this because I'm still in my 20s, so I don't really face this kind of issue. But uh, from watching that Jordan Peterson uh, interview and uh, talking to friends who are a little bit older than me, I feel like, uh, okay, this kind of issue might happen in the future. If like uh, if I'm in my 30s and I don't have kids, I might have like this kind of uh, anxiety and worry. But from my personal experience, I would say it has always been hard to find a person that I would know what their intentions are, really, because I felt like especially with uh, Tinder, uh, in my very early 20s or just meeting people uh, when we went out to party with my friends it was like uh, I don't know if this person is looking for something serious or they just want to play and uh, have fun and not get into a serious relationship and uh, I always had a desire to be in a serious relationship and, uh, you know, like, uh, I never wanted anything other than this. And I feel like uh, in case of my friends, uh, most of them were also like that. But we felt like uh, the men that we were meeting, they didn't really want anything serious. Um, not all of them, but in many cases, it was like that. Or they were not mature enough. Um, so that is my personal experience. I don't know about like uh, being in your 30s and not having a child, but I know that in the past, I even thought that I will never have children. Like, I don't ever want to have children. I remember uh, maybe being like 18, 19, and I was sure like, okay, this is not going to happen. I am just not a kind of girl that sees herself as a mom in the future. Uh, so I guess it was just my brain developing, not like uh, not being ready for certain things. And uh, now in my mid twenties, I feel like okay, I can be a mom. Uh, which uh, I don't know if other people go through that too. But maybe that could be a reason why many women struggle right now if they're like in their late thirties. And they don't have a child because they were like focusing on their career. I thought personally that I would be that kind of person to just focus on my career. But uh, then I have realized that actually family is way more important to me than career. And I was just lying to myself that I want to have like a great career and only focus on that. I think that was kind of a delusion that I had. Got it. I want to sh uh, shift gears to what body type of men do women prefer? So you remember when we saw those pictures at Jungle Gym? Yeah. <laughs> um, and others, uh, you know, other times we've had this discussion. So for those who don't know, when you go to Jungle Gym, uh, when we wash our hands, you see five... Um, and I think it's at the beach gym too, I'm not sure, but at the Pueblo gym, there's five sort of photos of men flexing and you know showing their physique. 
and these men basically look like they're about to go into a physique competition, right? Um, sort of a bodybuilding competition or a whatever beauty competition. And these are men, and you, you see they're all their their different muscles. You see that they have a you know big muscles. They they they're huge, and uh, they're flexing, looking certain ways. So, from your own personal experience, your own taste, the taste of your friends who are like you and other people, what sort of body type or what uh, do do they prefer and are attracted to, and what type of body type are women not attracted to, or as you said, those guys look like cartoons. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, obviously, I didn't mean anything negative with that, but uh, to me, in my personal opinion, also, I don't care about the body so much and not as much as I care about the character. I feel like that's way more important. So I would never be like, okay, I can't date you because you have like this body type that I don't like. Um, and I feel like many people are like that too. They, they are willing, even if this is not something they are super attracted to, they would be willing to compromise because they got like a really, really like awesome traits in different aspects. And, uh, but when it comes to my taste, I don't like those like uh, pumped bodies because to me it always looked like uh, not real, um, kind of looked fake. Um, and uh, yeah, I just like uh, natural, you know, uh, natural looking body, healthy, uh, lean. And uh, yeah, just just like that. Got it. Got it. Um, porn is an important topic. We we spoke about it this morning also. So, and I told you the story. One of my buddies, um, he's still addicted to porn. You know, he's uh, probably in his late thirties by now. We know a lot of married men who are addicted to porn, or at least watch porn. Um, I feel very lucky that I was to, I was able to get away from it and uh, I see it as evil. You know, I see it as the devil. Um, I see zero benefit in it, zero. Um, so I would, you know, but, but that I'm grateful. I got lucky. Okay. Somehow I escaped it. Maybe it was my upbringing. Maybe it was my religious background. Maybe it was my neuroscience background whatever, but I somehow figured it out, thank God. But a lot of people haven't figured it out. So from your own experience or your friend's experience, whatever you've heard, if a guy watches porn and he's in a relationship, how might that affect the relationship? And what do girls think, whether they're married or not, about their boyfriends or husbands watching porn? Well, I don't, I think many women might not even be aware of that. Uh, if they're in a relationship, uh, they might not even know that their partners are uh, watching porn. And uh, from my perspective, I haven't really thought a lot about this. But if I imagine myself being in a relationship and finding out that uh, whoever I am with uh, watches porn, I would feel pain. I would feel a lot of pain and uh, just uh, maybe even resentment. And uh, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to imagine. But uh, And I don't know if uh, other women would feel like that too. Because obviously maybe it's not like the worst problem ever that you can have in a relationship. But uh, I just feel very lucky that you don't have this issue and that we don't have to go through something like this. I feel extremely lucky. And uh, for sure, I consider this as a problem. Something that I would have to 
work through in a relationship what what gives you resentment what what if a guy is watching porn and he's in a relationship what does it what does the girl think that means for her and the bond between them it's um it's something that i feel you've already discussed discussed in your podcast i think uh with jameson or uh, maybe also the ones that you just recorded by yourself uh i really like the the way you said how when you treat somebody in a shallow way uh you also treat yourself in a shallow way so it's like a kind of like uh when somebody watches porn it's like uh just objectifying uh, girls and uh not really caring about the real bond that you can build with somebody and it's like uh, about um kind of animal instincts rather than getting it to the higher level so i would feel like uh i would feel a huge disappointment um relating to the fact that this is how you treat sex like this is it for you you think women are just objects that you can get pleasure from and uh it's not s- something deep for you are most women like that i have no idea but, i but i rarely your... i rarely talk uh with other people about stuff like that so hard to say how come why don't we have these types of discussions with people it's just not in my reality i don't think about this so much If somebody came to me with uh, this kind of problem, obviously I could discuss it, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Okay. Leo Tolstoy. You've been reading War and Peace for a while. You t- told me about the, you know, the war and the peace and the different uh, the dichotomy that he that he has in the book. For people who don't ever read, right? There's I used to be like that. I would I would never I I mean, I would listen to some audiobooks every now and then people recommended but i during phd i read a lot of papers i read papers even after but reading books like we read now like 4 or 5 hours a day for a while now right since like merida there is a certain shift in me for sure when i read all sorts of shit but all shit that i'm interested in and even stuff that's really boring like gulag is super boring but i'm still reading it at least i can feel the gulag while i read it what is your impression so far from reading war and peace about tolstoy what type of brain and mind is needed to be able to write something like that from your because you're also writing your your paper now your essay for your for your for your post grad um you you read someone like tolstoy and and obviously like your your mom is a avid reader so you have that uh in your environment since you were a kid right this yeah. reading environment for those who perhaps have never read tolstoy have never read dostoevsky or solzhenitsyn don't even start <laughs> right yeah well um you could say that if you if you really believe it without jokes but um how if any has reading transformed you and if it has in what ways that may even be subtle and nobody would figure out unless they actually did read well i think uh the books that transformed me the most uh would be the stoics philosophy or uh generally non-fiction uh because i read uh, also a lot of books about like management uh while i still was trying to advance my career in uh, business um or like self uh 
management uh, books. So uh, like uh, personal growth, etc. It transformed me big time. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, Stoics philosophy probably the most. Um, because it kind of uh, relates to my life uh, directly. And uh, then I remember I was just uh, reading a lot of nonfiction uh, or listening at first because uh, I was listening to audiobooks a lot before we started getting uh, the real uh, books. Um, and you told me that you should also read fiction. Um, I don't remember why. Uh, I think Jordan Peterson mentioned that. Yeah, he said fiction is more real than nonfiction. Yeah, so I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. So uh, the first one that I have started is uh, Tolstoy, War and Peace, which is like, uh, I don't know, 1,200 pages, uh, all of the volumes combined. And uh, at first it was uh, okay, then he started writing so much about war, and now I'm like, uh, I think, 400 pages in, almost, and uh, it's quite entertaining, but um, it's, uh, I would say it's better than Netflix, <laughs> or better than watching a movie, um, because it, I can use my imagination more with that, and it's like, it goes deeper, but I am still not like a huge fan, but it definitely, there is something about it that makes me feel like I am doing something good for myself. When, whenever I want, uh, I want some kind of entertainment, if I'm like, all right, I'm not going to turn on the TV or I'm not going to reach for my phone to scroll Instagram, but instead I will take this book and uh, read it. It just makes me feel really good about myself. It's like, oh, this is a kind of a healthy way of uh, entertaining myself. So, um, yeah, there is that. And um, as for Tolstoy himself, uh, I don't know how he managed to write this book, honestly. I think he was writing it for years. I read it in the introduction. I don't remember how many years, but it's like, it's a huge book. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how he did that. But, um, yeah, can't really say anything more about him. I need to just, like, dive Read all deeper. of his books. Yes. Anna Karenina next, after uh, War and Peace. Marta, the um, concept of listening, right? We, we, this is an important one. For me, for sure, it's an important one. The first time I read about the philosophy of listening was in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, Dr. Stephen Covey. And chapter four, I think it was um, something about, yeah, the chapter four's uh, title was Seek to Understand Before Being Understood. And in that chapter was a section on the art of listening. And he gave five stages of listening, right? So stage one was like, uh, uh, the, you're like looking at the person and you're uh, just staring. And then stage two, I don't remember all the stages, but it was, it became more and more deep listening and the fifth and final stage the the art like the, the proper way to listen is is when you mouth somebody <laughs> no no that's a sixth stage that only i know yeah the, the viewers might not know but uh you have like this tendency whenever somebody speaks i don't know if the editors can maybe uh, photoshop my mouth shut yeah, like uh, he mouths whatever uh, the person is saying to him. Maybe they, so maybe I do it in the podcast. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I hope the editors can find it. <laughs> Bloopers. Yeah, it's so funny. Yeah, it's um, yeah, be, like when when we when we are able to re re proclaim someone's sentence right so let's say you're telling me about um uh, i don't know uh, some childhood trauma 
that happened. And if I say, oh yeah, you know, when I was five years old, blah, blah, blah. That's not good listening. Yep. Because you don't give a fuck about my child. Like you want help from mm -hmm. me, right? This is like mm -hmm. a, in- um, Or you might not even want help. You might sure. just want somebody to listen to you. Which is the biggest give help give you of all. attention, yeah. That's the biggest help of all. And I know um, in Andrew Carnegie's book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he said, uh, he also said this, like, don't, uh, don't just like talk about your shit, like nobody cares. But Martha, the, the reason I'm asking is, with the addiction of social media, video games, Netflix, cell phones, blah, blah, blah. Have you experienced yourself when you're speaking to someone and they are not fully present? Of course. Okay. So many times in my life. If you can give some examples, and let, let's see if um, people can relate to that, and then let's see, see if we can figure out how to solve that. Yeah, like, for example, I remember there were times that I would go to a restaurant with somebody and they would be, like, on their phone. And uh, I always felt um, maybe it was not very conscious, but unconsciously I kind of felt like a lack of uh, respect. But not conscious. Like, you weren't cu cursing at them or you weren't, like, hating them. No, I was like, uh, I just kind of felt it. But, but were uh, you doing it also? I think so uh -huh. at that time too, yeah. Got it, so it was both ways. Yeah, so it's like kind of like having a conversation at the same time being at your phone. So the person would be talking to you and you'd be on your phone and you were okay with it? Yeah, but it was a long time ago. And then I remember at some point in my life, I made it like a thing for me to try to never take out my phone when I am with somebody at dinner or when we are like eating together, I was uh, consciously not taking my phone unless like I want to take When did that a, happen? Oh, when I was still in Poland, I think maybe like five years ago. Why did you make that decision? Because I just felt like uh, it's, it's kind of rude when that happens, when you're like having this uh, time with somebody like this nice time with somebody and uh, then when you take out your phone it kind of ruins the moment but what if when you're by yourself eating breakfast or shitting or standing in starbucks and you take out your phone aren't that's, you that's, disturbing time with yourself i would say yeah if you take it to the next level uh you should also not take the phone out if you're by yourself and I used to do that a lot when I would just eat out and uh, have breakfast have uh, lunch have dinner and uh, I was eating and I had my phone out and I was like uh. Uh, checking something on my phone and then I have realized not so long ago like maybe a year ago uh, more or less that it deprives me of my quality time with myself or like even just uh it doesn't allow me to be in the moment and to notice uh, everything that's going on around me. So when I started to consciously, even in those moments when I'm by myself, not take my phone and not get that easy dopamine, um, I became way more happy. So it's the intention, right? If you take out your phone deliberately for work, Let's say you want to watch a YouTube video because you want to learn about the solar system, right? Or you uh, want to message your mom for happy birthday or your sister for happy birthday, right? That's different from you being bored and taking your phone out because you want to escape boredom. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's, that's really important what you mentioned. Uh, to me, it's all about the intention. And it's totally fine if you use your phone as a tool to accomplish something that you have planned. But what I have noticed in my personal experience is that all those applications, they are designed in a way to take you away from whatever your plan was. So what happens to me is I would go on YouTube uh, with an intention to watch a certain video or a podcast or whatever, and then something else would show up. 
in the recommended section and I would click on it and then I'm like uh, in the next video and uh, and I don't even know how like uh, next 30 minute passes and I'm like wow they just robbed me of my time because that was not my intention to do that same thing with Instagram even if I go in and I want to check what my friends are doing I would see some recommended reel uh which is like most likely some bullshit, but I would still uh, get drawn to it somehow and click on it and then I'm watching the next one and the next one and thank God I don't have TikTok because that would be, <laughs> my life would be over probably because I know we have this vulnerability and uh, we can get like uh even the person with the strongest mind might get impacted by those tools that these companies are using. And uh, yeah, so back to what I was saying, it's really hard to do something that you have an intention for uh, without getting distracted while you're using your phone. I don't know if you have the same kind of experience, but that's what it's like for me. And that's why I'm trying to use uh, the social media apps or even YouTube less and less in my life because I just don't want to get robbed of my precious time. And I'm always like, oh, um, if I'm watching certain video, does it give me value or does it give me just a very simple, easy entertainment? And what could I be doing instead with my time that would benefit me? Yeah. Yeah, you said it right. There's a... Uh, I read uh, something about hunter-gatherers and the, they said that even men, you know, 100,000 years ago when they would go to the bathroom, they would take someone with them. You know how girls go to the bathroom? Hey, let's go to the little girl's room. And it's like, take their, your girlfriend with you. Men used to do that as well. And obviously we don't do that anymore. But the reason we did it 100,000 years ago is because we could get killed. And it's always good to have someone there because you don't have a cell phone to text them. right? So they have to be there in person. And this takes me back to the concept of family. Let me tell you what I mean. When we used to wake up in the morning during hunter-gatherer time, I'm assuming we would have family around, Right? the tribe would be around. Now there is no tribe. Let's say when you went to university, when you went, went to vet school, when I went to university, when I went to grad school, it was just me, right? Usually it was just me. Even when I traveled, it's just me. So when we wake up in the morning, there is no tribe. You are alone in the room, right? So what do you do? You go on Instagram. Because your tribe is there, right? The phone gives a false impression that it represents the tribe. And I bet you, if the family structure of the world was better, where we lived with connection to our families and bonds and intense emotional connection, attachment, we would use the phone way less. And this takes me back to a, one of the first TED Talks I saw about addiction. This is like maybe seven, eight years ago. The guy said, the opposite of addiction is... What do you think? Freedom. It is, yes. He mentioned connection. 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 He's like, the people who are addicted to something is because they lack connection, real connection with something, right? So, for example, the guy who's uh, addicted to porn and he has he's married with, with kids. I bet you, if he felt a real connection with his family, he would not be watching porn. No fucking way. You think so? I know so. Because the reason I was able to quit porn, 
yes, I know I, you know, I, I, I know the practical reason because I wrote that email about my mom. My mom would die if I, if I watch porn, fine. That helped. But the reason I wrote that email is because I had massive connection to my purpose. This is the key. When we are amateurs, we don't have a purpose. We don't have responsibility. You know, we talked about amateur versus pro this morning, right? Stephen Pressfield taught us about what a pro is, right? I think his second book is like turn, turn, turning pro. I think after the the art of uh, the war of art, he said that the difference between amateurs and pros are that pros do their work no matter what. They're disciplined in their work. They have routines. They give a fuck about their work. Whereas amateurs, they do their work because they feel like it. Or it's like something fun. Or because an amateur would very quickly scroll social media because the responsibility is not there. So I believe that there are two, so far I've discovered two big overarching concepts of why people are addicted. One is lack of connection with family. And two is lack of connection with their purpose. And this is something we talked about with Ayub four hours for, for a couple of days ago, right? When Ayub was here. And for me, my connection to my family was the same. But my purpose changed. I decided in that moment that if I was to become a successful person financially, in business, in family life, in my health, I have to quit porn. I must quit. So it was connection with purpose that helped me. I think that's what's missing. And, 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 and you know this, when I went to have lunch with Elliot last year in Florida, he told me, hopefully, actually today I had the thought that uh, I'll invite Elliot for my 100th episode. Awesome. I had this thought. Yeah, I'll tell him that, hey man, I've done 99. I'm, I'm ready for you. Let's go. 100 for you. Because uh, I know uh, when Huberman got to 100, he invited Lex Friedman. Oh, wow. Right? Because Lex Friedman's the guy who encouraged Huberman to start a podcast. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Lex was the, he wasn't the reason, but Lex was a huge contributor okay. in terms of motivation. He's All like, right. Huberman, you got to do it. Andrew, you got to do it. And uh, obviously, Andrew's uh, first meant like sort of inspiration was Tim Ferriss, but then the encouragement to actually do the podcast was Lex. So, yeah, what. If we were to build the framework for someone who is addicted to X, X, right? Because um, we can we can go into this if you if you want if you if you if you would like to discuss what happened with when you went to visit your family. If you want to discuss that, we can because that relates to connection with family. Yeah, I don't think I really want to talk about. Okay, that. so let's not talk about that. Maybe, maybe later. Maybe we can do one hundred and one, the one hundred first episode. Well, I, I would want to be one hundred then. <laughs> okay, well there you go. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I already got two episodes. I'm good. That's right. That's right. Now you can have uh, all hundred, every single one. Um, yeah. So for me, it was that. So when someone today we had a. Uh, you know, I told you there was a someone emailed and said, "Hey, I'm addicted to porn and whatnot, and I want to get coaching," which happens, you know, every now and then. And so, the answer is, whatever you are doing in life is not your purpose. It's that simple. The family you have, the girlfriend you have, is not the right family or girlfriend. So. You think so? Yeah, I know so. I know so. I would more... I know it's extreme, but I believe yeah, this. For me, it would always start with yourself. Like, you 
have to work on yourself and then look at the externals. Well, what I'm saying is symptoms of why you're addicted. I'm not saying what they need to fix yet, right? Family and purpose can only be fixed from what you just said, working mm -hmm. on yourself. Yeah. So if someone, let's say, is in their mid-20s, early 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever, with family or without family, and they genuinely are addicted to something, porn, drugs, alcohol, social media, cell phones, gambling, whatever. Is can we build a framework for them to be able to take the first step towards stopping that addiction? What is the first step? I think obviously you gotta realize that you have this addiction. That's like the very first basic step. You have to realize that this is a problem that you need to work on because even, you know, there are so many people who are addicted to cigarettes or to alcohol or many other things, like gambling, whatever that is. Many times they family, their family, they know, their friends, they know, everybody around them knows. But the person who is addicted, they're like, no, I'm good. Like, what are you talking about? I'm fine. I'm just... Uh, Denial. Yeah, exactly. So... First thing, without this person admitting, yes, I am addicted, I, ha I have this problem, you won't achieve nothing. That's what I believe. Even when I used to smoke cigarettes, I kind of knew it's not good for me. I knew like uh, it's destroying my health. But that was not enough. Like, uh, I didn't have this profound understanding that, hey, this is a problem I have to get rid of right now. Not like, uh, oh, one day I will stop smoking. Oh, one day I will just be able to stop. And uh, many people around me were saying, like, you shouldn't do that. Other people didn't really say anything. But even if those people around me noticed that, and even if they cared for my health and were trying to help me until I got that true deep understanding that I have this problem, one, and two, I am actually able to do something with it right now and not delay it into the unknown time in the future, then, yeah, and until that happened, I, I couldn't stop smoking. Yesterday. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to say, and then you know the story, how it happened, right? Like uh, you have to have uh, um, people around you who will support you. Um, what helped in my case was changing the environment and blah, blah, blah. But then none of this matters until you realize that you got to do something with it right now. Urgency. Urgency. Yeah, and that's what we also spoke about uh, this morning before recording this podcast. Urgency and... Uh, how real the problem is feeling feeling it you know because the same thing i i said about uh how i started working out uh in order to improve my health because uh i was in pain like i couldn't walk i had the like my lower back was hurting when i was just walking uh, or my knee was hurting or my ankle was hurting and I couldn't go down the stairs and I'm in my 20s. So I'm like, uh, there is something wrong here. So 
that's what also motivated me to start working out, which I am doing until now, and I am very happy with it. And I, I don't think I'm ever going to stop now because uh, it gives me so much joy. But there is a reason why I haven't worked out at the gym ever in my life. And then at some point I started because I felt like, oh shit, I am in deep trouble. Because why does my back hurt so much when I'm just walking? Right? But do you, if you were in an environment where this was normal, you wouldn't do anything, would you? Hard to say. Because imagine you're addicted to cigarettes and you're coughing, and uh, you may even cough up blood. But if your family is coughing up blood, if your friends are coughing up blood, then you wouldn't think about it, would you? Not so much. But even... When I was coughing from smoking, I was like, yeah, that's okay. Like, uh, one day I'll quit. I'm still young. And uh, only a few years, you know, like, uh, there's no no chance that I have uh, fucked something up in my body. Like, uh, there are people who smoke for 40 years or 50 years, 60 years, and they're good. That was the kind of lying to myself that i was doing confirmation bias yeah and i was like you know people are taking drugs people are doing worse things like i'm good so facing immense pain is a sign that you need to change something because when you are still remember at la quinta we would go down the stairs and you wouldn't be able to, so we started taking the elevator. You would, you couldn't go down simple steps. Oh yeah, and it was how many days? Like uh, more than a week, right? And uh, I was doing those uh, ice compress. That's right. We got the ice. Yeah, it's crazy. So that is a blessing because you encountered pain early in life, and now you made a transformation. Exactly. Or even uh, two days ago, I was uh, moving something, uh, some like furniture at the gym. And uh, immediately I got like a lower back pain, which is with me still now after two days, I think. And uh, that made me realize like, hey, probably I'm using my lower back too much when I'm like trying to uh, put something on the ground or lift something. And uh, I took it as a blessing, like, okay, I can change my life because clearly I have been doing something wrong and uh, there is still time to fix it. So I'm, grat I gra I'm grateful for it, even though I'm in pain right now. But that's a blessing, as you say. Yeah. There is a concept of being tired because of dreaming so much, becoming exhausted from dreaming. Now, there are some people out there who would love to be in a position where they have dreams, they remember their dreams, they have lucid dreams, they can control their dreams. It'd be fun. It'd be super fun. Then there are people who have lucid dreams, who have dreams every night, and it might exhaust them. Tell me about your sleeping schedule nowadays. And how has your sleeping schedule evolved? And how, what is optimal for you? And if the optimal doesn't happen, then what happens in your life? Sleep is super, super important for me, as you know. Maybe the first most important thing to me. And uh, yeah, nothing, nothing comes before sleep. And I have realized this uh, through some negative experiences in my life when I was uh, neglecting my uh, uh, sleep because I didn't think it was so essential but now I know it is so uh, yeah as you know we always make sure to uh, be in bed ideally before 8 p.m and uh, obviously be in bed and sleep 
around the same time every day. This is really, really crucial, which uh, has also been proven scientifically. I think this is also uh, broadly mentioned in this episode of uh, Dr. Huberman's podcast with uh, Dr. Gina Po, uh, how certain processes in the brain can only happen if you sleep every day at the same time. Because if you delay it, then uh, um, you know exactly what happens. The growth right? hormone release. Yeah, and then, and then another thing is uh, the cleaning of the... Uh, neurotoxins. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so uh, this is super important. And I have uh, noticed that firsthand in me as well. So uh, being in bed around eight, ideally, then uh, sleeping, I need like eight to nine hours of sleep, I think. So depending on when I actually fall asleep, uh, I will get like eight and nine hours, eight or nine hours of sleep, ideally. And it also can vary. I I never uh, set an alarm these days, just uh, wake up naturally or you wake me up. Uh, when I ask you. So that's also one of the cool things, like uh, not really needing an alarm clock. And uh, yeah, I just let myself rest as much as I need and uh, keep the same sleeping schedule every day. And uh, as you mentioned, dreaming. Uh, so I have lucid dreams, uh, not so often, Sometimes there will be periods in my life when I have uh, more lucid dreams and sometimes I would not have them. I don't know what it uh, really depends on, but these days I never really try to have them. It just happens. And uh, closely related to that are uh, the uh, moments where I have sleep paralysis which you know sometimes it gets like uh, really weird uh, when I even try to, uh, when I make some sounds or try to scream because uh, it's so unpleasant and so uncomfortable. And I know many people when they have sleep paralysis, they have like some visions. But for me, I don't really have any visual uh, sensations. I don't experience anything like that. But for me, it's just the uncomfortable feeling of being stuck uh, in between the state of uh, dream and the reality, uh, the waking state. And it's like uh, I'm just stuck and I don't know how long it will last or sometimes I will have uh, like this kind of loop, a dream within the dream within the dream when I'm like waking up to another dream and to another dream and I feel like it's never going to end. So uh, I know whenever I sleep very like vividly and uh, whenever I have lucid dreams, these things might happen. So... Uh, Maybe if you don't have lucid dreams uh, and you don't have that, you can consider yourself lucky in a way because those things are are not fun, at least to me. But um, even if I don't have lucid dreams, I have uh, I remember most of my dreams. Sometimes uh, I forget what I dreamt about during the day and I remember that uh, first thing in the morning. Sometimes I remember... Uh, like uh, I remember it uh, clearly throughout the whole day or sometimes I will just remember because I see something uh, and that reminds me of whatever I dreamt about. And it's pretty cool. I really, really enjoy my dreams. And uh, yeah, it's pretty fun. Some people have the notion that they are not creative. Creativity is something that we get encouraged to be, to, to do. And in school, we hear, oh, this guy is so creative. Look at the you new know, dance move he, he made or new music or he invented something, right? Yeah. There is this really exciting notion of a creative person. We really respect this in our Western society. What is your relationship with creativity? How do you see creativity in your everyday life? And do you think that your belief 
in your own creativity has changed and why? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because I actually, uh, I talked to Catherine about this just a few days ago. And uh, yeah, and it's really funny that you're asking this. But I also, uh, I think, discussed this with you uh, in the past, for sure. So um, I, for quite a long time in my life, I believe that I'm not a creative person. Uh, and that could be because I was pretty much studying science and uh, that mostly involved just memorizing uh, stuff and then like uh, copying whatever is in the book uh, into like the exam. So just memorizing and then putting it on the paper, whatever I memorized. And it did not involve any creation. And I think you can relate also as a science person. Um, there seems to be not a lot of room for creativity in the, sci in the scientific fields. Um, well, it, although, dep it depends. Although, yeah, Just right, depends. Now, right yeah. now I see it like uh, how you could get creative in that too. But maybe at the beginning stages when you don't do your own research and uh, you don't have like your lab, but you're basically just learning about the stuff that has been done by other researchers. I don't think it, inv it involves creativity, do you? I got lucky because in my engineering school, my first degree in my undergrad, they trained us to believe that memorization is for losers. Okay. Like the, the principle was you should derive everything, right? So if you look at Einstein's e equals mc squared, it can be derived from Newton's laws, Yeah. right? It's yeah. derivative. So everything should be figured out from something fundamental. Mm. Don't memorize shit. That was taught in engineering school as one of the principles. So when I got into neuroscience and I had to memorize stuff, I hated it. I thought this was a stupid teacher or a stupid school or a stupid subject is making me memorize some shit. Yeah, because I get that. in experiments, you don't have to do that. For sure. Yeah. But uh, so imagine in my vet school, uh, not in all of the subjects, but there were situations when the only way you could pass an exam is when you memorize like word by word, whatever was uh, written in the book or whatever the professor said during the lecture. Uh, it's like if you mess one word, you are not getting the point. So there was a huge impact put on like uh, memorization and not really on truly understanding. Why is that? Why do schools do that shit? Everyone I wish does I knew. That. I wish I knew. I believe that it's to program children into following and not creating. Think about that, right? Imagine you had a teacher who said, hey, let's figure it out. Not Don't memorize anything. Let's figure it out. Let's go out there and discover yeah, what, and what we're talking about. There are teachers like that, but I feel like the further you go with your uh, education path, the less fun and creativity you will encounter, also depending on like the field that you are studying. Because uh, I feel like in vet school, there was not much room for that. Uh, and if I wanted to pursue some field in art, obviously that would have been different probably, right? Maybe that would encourage my creativity. But the point that I'm getting to is that now I don't believe that I am not a creative person. Uh, and I have no idea why I thought like, okay, that's just not me. I am not able to create. Maybe because I really hate it uh, whenever I had to write an essay in uh, high school about some kind of literature. Um, because it was like forcing me, the topic was forced upon me and I was like, I don't like that shit. But uh, these days when I can just choose whatever field I want to be creative at. 
uh, like I have a lot of freedom and it's something that I'm enjoying and it's something that I can pour my soul into or my heart into. And uh, I just changed this belief. I stopped uh, categorizing myself in a way. I stopped thinking, oh, I am this and I am not that. And I am for sure this, uh, but I am not that. And I stopped this kind of uh, way of thinking, uh, letting myself be more flexible and uh, basically giving myself freedom to become whatever I want to be. And not thinking like, okay, I'm not like that, so I won't be that, right? Like just uh, how I decided to learn uh, programming, uh, even though I was never really uh, into that field. Of course, I was always interested in computers. And uh, Did you ever tell yourself that you're not a programmer? Like when in your old jobs? Did you have the notion that you are not the type of person who is a programmer? Did you ever think about that? Well, yeah, because I thought like this involves too much knowledge that I don't have. It's like uh, there's some secret stuff, like the secret languages that everybody in that field knows and I don't know, even though I always loved uh, computers. And uh, yeah, I also mentioned to you, like uh, as a child, I, I was using HTML and uh, really, really into it. But then I, uh, I got into science, so uh, that's why I was not doing that. But because I didn't put the limitations upon me and I was not like, oh, it's too hard. I can't do it now uh, when I'm like in my mid 20s. Uh, that allowed me to just go and uh, try something exciting. And I didn't think that, oh, this is not for me. I am not creative enough to do that. When you think of logic versus languages, right? Because you've been, you, I know you're, you're obviously starting off and learning programming, and that's awesome. For someone who knows nothing about programming, right? From whatever you've learned so far, the projects you've done, the languages you've learned, the courses you've taken, even though you're maybe one or two steps ahead of this person, what is the greatest advice you can give to someone young or old trying to learn programming from scratch so they can really understand coding, math, have their brain wire itself for analytical problem solving? Yeah, I would say, first of all, find a course that would uh, provide you with steps and uh, you will have like a plan of what to do, what to learn, uh, designed by somebody with uh, more experience. Also, I remember I had an issue with uh, choosing the language that I wanted to learn. And uh, I was like, uh, oh, what should I start with? Uh, do I make a good decision? And I still don't know. I chose uh, Python, but I would say maybe uh, don't think too much about the language. Just uh, choose based on your intuition or based on the advice that you receive. But don't think like, oh, I chose this language and now there is no going back because uh, that's what many people have told me and that's what I'm also discovering um, by myself now that I'm learning it is uh, logic is more important than the actual language. And uh, with basically pretty much all the languages, you will, you will be able to achieve the same goal, just in different ways. So the most important thing is to learn how the logic works. And uh, maybe it was easier for me because I just, uh, I love this kind of stuff and I've always loved uh, maths. So I was really happy whenever these uh, assignments that I had uh, involved uh, like solving mathematical problems. I was always really, really happy about it and had a lot of fun with it. And uh, one huge thing um, that I would probably tell myself um, 
to like uh, the version of myself that is just starting with uh, programming is to not get discouraged if I encounter something that I don't understand because uh, not having this kind of extensive education in computer science, uh, I obviously also didn't really go or didn't have a chance to understand what like uh, binary numbers are or hexadecimal numbers. So this, I felt, wh whenever I read this, I was like, oh, I don't fully get it. And uh, I was trying to get it at the very, uh, like uh, at the beginning stages of my learning. And I felt like if I just uh, ignored it, at that time and uh, just uh, did whatever followed, I would uh, achieve uh, my results quicker. Because then uh, after learning more and more, I was, I was able to go back to those topics that seemed difficult. And uh, all of a sudden I got it. I was like, oh, this is so easy. So I would say... Uh, Never get discouraged if there is something you don't fully get. Just uh, continue and uh, at some point you will get it through repetition, through practice. Maybe you will take a different course that will explain it in a different way. So yeah, I would say that was the most important thing. Thank you for that. The uh, reason I asked is because a lot of people, they have been told by family members what they can and cannot be right because uh, for example um i don't know if you know this guy um cal Penn. indian guy he's an actor in hollywood cal Penn. he was in the movie um uh white castle uh, uh kumar harold and kumar go to white castle anyway he, he played kumar so cal Penn, when he was growing up wanted to be an actor but belonging to an Indian family, it was, uh, you know, obviously not the not the choice that anyone wants. But anyway, he became an actor and he became good. And uh, his parents weren't like completely against it, right? But there's obviously this vibe in Indian culture of becoming a doctor, but, but he became an actor. And then um, he became really good. He was the, at, at a certain point, I think he's still now, the most famous and highest paid actor of Indian origin that's in Hollywood. Then Cal Penn came out as gay. And uh, what's interesting is that his parents and his brothers, you know, his sibling, I think he has a sister, they already knew. He had already told them, but he hadn't told the world, right? And it, it, it's, inter it's interesting because I met Cal in Toronto once. He was in line at a, at a, a concert. And I saw him and I saw his couple of his buddies and I said... Uh, uh, hey, you know, I, I wanted to pretend that I don't know Cal because I wanted to him to be normal. So I went up to him and I'm like, hey, guys, uh, what is this line for? This big line concert. So Cal spoke and said, oh, it's for, we're watching this lady. Uh, she's really famous. She's come here for a concert. And uh, I was like, oh, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. And then I kept going. It was great. Have a communication. Now, the reason I bring this up is that when Cal was growing up or as any kid growing up, the, the parent could say, you are this, you are not this, right? Or we are this, we are not this, right? So for example, when I was growing up, it was, you are someone who makes A's, you are not someone who goes out to party. You are someone who does good in science and math, and you are not someone who cares about music dance, Right? So there's this, you are, you're not, you are, you're not. Now, when someone is growing up and they are told that they are creative or they are not creative, they don't have to be told directly, right? So for example, imagine a kid who is making a sandcastle at the beach. You're the one who helped me figure this out for myself, right? I never used to make this. I never used to play at the beach. I never used to enjoy the waves. I thought it was all a waste of time. But you brought me into this nature, this beauty of, of the beach. And this beauty yeah, of, of... I can't believe you've never done it before. I had never done it. 
I'd never build a sand castle. None. It was like with the, with uh, Zach and it, it was the first time. And um, so we are told these things. So if today someone believes that they are X and they are not Y, how can someone take a step back and really do a self audit of who am I? What questions should be asked? Because this concept of a gift, and I truly believe this, Martha, once we figure out our true gift, I think all the anxiety will go away. I think this is like a hack to trauma. Everyone has trauma. That, that's a bold statement. Everyone has trauma, baby. Everybody. Everyone has childhood problems. Everyone gets molested somehow, emotionally, physically, mentally. But the power of understanding your gift, not like Prince, oh, I have this gift of music, but I'm also going to overdose. Not like that. I don't that. know. Like I, uh, I spiritual gift. Maybe I don't fully get this concept of gift, because that does not really resonate with me. I I'm just feeling like uh, I want to get rid of the ego and uh, not think about like what sets me apart. Uh, just do my thing. Don't try to categorize myself. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, I don't, f I'm not feeling this gift or purpose concept. I never really got it or like a talent, whatever. I mean, I kind of get that, but not like I don't feel it. You know what I mean? I would say, right. I would say for me, the most important thing was to. not think like one thing or the other about myself not put a label on myself not categorize myself in, a, in e even a good way yeah because you can't have because both. that limits me you get it yeah it pigeonholes you into one niche that oh i am this and it tells your mind that then you cannot be any of this other stuff yeah, that's what I think. Yesterday, you learned something new. And then you Did taught me. <laughs> and then you taught me how to do it properly. I, uh, yeah. And honestly, I felt so much pleasure and love, happiness, joy, peace, tranquility. Watching you get so excited about this new thing that you created, right? Creativity. Perhaps in the past, you told yourself or others told you or others maybe reacted to the way you were doing is like, oh, she'll never figure it out. Yeah. And then you may have had the concept that you are not the type of person who does this. Yep. But yesterday you figured it out. Yeah. So tell us what happened. That, that's a really, really good example. I'm happy you brought this up. So um, I learned how to like snap with my fingers. Uh, and I did it for the first time uh, now in my mid 20s because whenever i was trying to learn how to do it and it's like a very simple thing so many people do it uh whenever i was trying to learn that i never succeeded and so many people tried to teach me so many people and then another attempt i think you were trying to teach me maybe for the second time and all of a sudden i got it and then i kept practicing to the point that i showed you uh, how to do it better. And yeah. uh, it's so awesome. So I believe it really has to do with what we just talked about, which is uh, I did not allow myself to 
keep this kind of label like i'm not the person who does this and i remember i used to when i was uh, really really young i was very skinny um and uh, i used to kind of label myself as the type of girl who is skinny and who never works out or never uh, builds any muscle. So I really wanted to maintain that kind of image and not so much for the other people to see, but I wanted to like have this image for myself, if you know what I mean. And uh, so my brain could like uh, label me as uh, the skinny girl that never works out and never has any muscle. And uh, at some point in my life, I got rid of that. I was like, no, I want to have a healthy body and uh, I don't need to be the skinniest girl in the room. Anorexia nervosa, right? This is the psychiatric illness. And actually, I learned this from Huberman as well. It is the most popular, the most common psychiatric illness in the world, anorexia. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And so let's, for the final sort of, uh, uh, it's not the final question, I have a final question at the end, but for the final topic, let's delve into anorexia because I know in my firsthand experience, I once wrote an article and um, it was specifically about models who get treated uh, unfairly in their talent agencies and are told to you know, lose 20 pounds. In two weeks, lose 20 pounds. Get the fuck out of here. Like a really, really strict regimen. And I've had friends who've told me for, from their experiences that they were very... Uh, the, the talent agencies were very rude to them. And they strictly told them, do this, do this, do this. And you, coming from a modeling background and being in those shows and being in those talent agencies and being with the people who told you X or Y, what does a girl feel? What did you feel when it was your relationship with food, when it came to your body image? Yeah, so that's really funny because I was always naturally skinny uh, and uh, I am tall. So uh, naturally I wanted to try and make it in the modeling industry. And um, I worked at some, I had some gigs, but I never really truly made it. Um, I believe because of my hips which uh, are naturally wide. And even if I was super skinny, I could never have the perfect uh, measurements because of my hips. And uh, it's just something that uh, I couldn't do anything about. And I remember that made me insecure when I was growing up. And uh, it's so insane when I think about this now because I was insanely skinny but still I wanted to lose weight so I was like uh, maybe trying to limit uh, my food but it was like uh, just episodes in my life when that happened it was like maybe uh, I will have a certain diet for a week or two when I was like uh, 16 years old um, was still it was unhealthy but I'm happy it has never uh, become anything worse because uh, at some point I was just like, no, uh, I'm, I'm okay. And uh, so many people around me were like, uh, you're so skinny. What are you doing? And uh, I saw that. And I had this kind of weird relationship uh, with my body when I knew that I was skinny. But then I was like, oh, but I want to uh, weigh less than 50 kilograms which now I'm probably uh, more than 60 and I don't even care, honestly. Uh, I don't even know and, uh, and for sure have a healthy relationship with my body now um, because I see food in a different way than I ever used to. Um, yeah, but I never really had uh, any severe um, 
disease or condition related to food, thank God. Um, but for sure, uh, it was crazy when I was told that uh, I would need to lose weight even when I was super skinny, only because uh, of my hip bones being so uh, spread apart. That didn't even have anything to do uh, with fat. It was just the bones, you know? So, yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> that is. What is beauty to you when it comes to human beings, nature, animals, inanimate objects? When you feel something is beautiful, what it's happens? It's a hard question. It's a really hard question because it's like... A something that I cannot really explain in words or cannot make a concept out of it. It's like, uh, I know it's beauty when I feel it. And for sure, this has changed to me. And uh, I see it in a completely different way than I used to see it as a teenager, for example, when I would uh, be like, oh, uh, this girl is so pretty. Uh, I want to look like her. Or uh, like these uh, outfits are so cute. I want to get them to look beautiful. Now I don't see it like that. I focus more on the internal beauty or even um, just emotions. Or uh, as you said, nature, animals, plants. Um, I try to see beauty in every moment and just... Uh, be in awe uh, because we are here, right? Because we are here on earth and uh, we get to appreciate that. And we don't have to categorize anything like this is beautiful and this is not. I try to see everything as beauty and the, the most out of everything, I like uh, realness and genuine emotion. So to me, not like the facial structures or uh, perfect bodies, it's not really beauty to me. When I see real emotion or somebody being vulnerable, this is to me beauty. Okay, thank you for that honest answer and uh, thank you for being vulnerable. Now the final question, it's more of a... Uh, a demonstration um can you pretend that i don't know how to snap my fingers no and uh just step by step this is a this is a a, a demonstration of how someone can learn something very strategically step by step right pretend i don't know and i'm gonna pretend i don't know either okay <laughs> okay so tell me what to do okay so uh Put your hand here so I can see it. Right hand or left hand? Uh, you can do your right hand. I think left is easier for me now. So, but so let's say my right hand. Okay. I'm right handed. Okay. So what I put, put it up like this. Yeah, and try to follow whatever I'm doing. So I'll put those two fingers like that. Uh -huh. Now I don't remember how you snap. Okay, uh, try to... Yeah, stay there, stay there, stay there so we can see it in the camera too. Okay, I got it. Like this? Yeah, and uh, put those two fingers together. Oh, together, okay, got it. Yeah, and then uh, this finger here in the middle. Yes. It's like the most important one because you will try to get it to hit here. All okay? Right. And uh, just go, Let me let me practice because I don't know if I remember it. Okay. Wow, I got it. that's crazy. So um, try to let this finger slide off this uh, thumb uh -huh. and start with your thumb just, just like you're doing it. Uh -huh. And uh, let it slide and put as much force as you can from coming from both of these fingers. Like that? Yay! Yes. So... Am I going like that? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, it, it will not work the all, 
like uh, each time, but you can make it. So I have to go from here. Yeah. Like that. How do I get it to make it sound like yours? Like that. Yeah, ah, you did it. Like that. So maybe around this area. Hey. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, you will get it. You will practice. <laughs> ah, there. It. I have to move my f head like this. Look. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you. It's like. <laughs> see. For sure. Wow. <laughs> <sighs> um. You had that on your list of questions for me. Maybe, like. maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um. Baby, thank you really for your time and your honesty there are a couple of questions which were and again you were honest it's better to be honest about not being in the moment about certain answers yeah and you just say for for later or for never it's all good so thank yeah. you i think it's important to ask the questions anyway regardless of wh whether the answers are there or not even in life philosophically it's better to ask ourselves important, hard questions, even if there are no answers. Asking the question is what matters, not whether there's an answer or not. So thank you so much for your time and your love and uh, your beauty. And uh, Yeah, thank you so much also for your time and just for giving me space again to conquer my fears right because this is also uh something i'm not used to and uh, you're making me feel really comfortable in this kind of setting so i'm really really grateful and yeah i've had a really really good time thank you so much <laughs>